Good evening, everyone. My name is Amanda DeMeo, and on behalf of the Darien Library and Museum of Darien, we welcome you to our program tonight, Leaving Connecticut, Shaping America with Walter Woodward. Walter W. Woodward, can I call you Triple W? Sure. <laughs> They've been doing that for years, <laughs> among other things. Uh-oh. <laughs> Walter is the fifth person to hold the position of state historian which was created in the 1930s in preparation for Connecticut's 300th anniversary. The state historian is appointed by the trustees of the University of Connecticut and is a faculty member in the Yukon Department of History. Walter is a scholar of early American and Atlantic world history with an emphasis on Connecticut and New England. His research interests cover a variety of subjects, including witchcraft, alchemy, and the history of science, the use of music in early America and environmental history. I don't know if, if you happen to join us um, back in October, where he talked about witchcraft, which was excellent. Walter is the author of five books, and his most recent is Creating Connecticut. I hope you can see it. I gotta put it like this. <laughs> we have a few <laughs> copies of the library. If you want to borrow them, write me a message and I'll put it on hold for you. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this, as well as our collections, available to the community. And please welcome Walter Woodward. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you for coming. It's really nice on this pretty cold and certainly very snowy up in this part of Connecticut. Uh, uh, I don't know how you guys did down there, but I'm up here in Columbia, the quiet corner, and it's right now the quiet snow covered corner about two feet. So we are, uh, we are well covered. Anyway, I thank you for coming out. It's a pleasure to be here. Before I begin my talk, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Um, and what I'd like to do before I begin. <clears throat> This is a picture, by the way, that relates to the talk tonight. These are a group of uh, 18th century tavern signs from the Connecticut Historical Society uh, in Hartford. It has one of the best collection of tavern signs in the country, and these are from that collection. But that's, uh, that's not the thing I wanted to begin with. I wanted to invite you all if you like tonight's talk, or if you just would like to know a little bit more about Connecticut history, to tune into or use your web or subscribe or listen to uh, the public radio station uh, and participate in a program that we do out of the Office of the State Historian called Today in Connecticut History. So as, as I was saying, what you're looking at is on a slide a, a, uh, a screen snapshot of the homepage of the website todayinconnecticuthistory.com. Of course, as the state historian of Connecticut, one of the, you know, my primary mission is to help the people of Connecticut engage with the fascinating history of the state, which admittedly, uh, because it's not taught very much in schools, many Connecticuts don't know much about their history. And I, once they come to learn about it, they, they become quite fascinated. Uh, and this is a program that, that we've had remarkable success with. I'm going to click through to the web page for a minute and show you what uh, the Today in Connecticut History website looks like. Now, we have thousands of subscribers who get the, a... a little insight into this story in their mailbox every morning. There are people who hear it on the radio. There are people who, who click through from Facebook or Twitter. But uh, many people come to the web for their story. And like today's story is about the man who made the first map of the United States, a man from Connecticut. And what we do on this website is we have a story that tells about Abel Buell, who is the man who made this first map, about the map itself. And then we have some links to other stories if you want to know more. And at the top, we have a little audio story of, that tells you about Abel Buell. These are, these, these are the ones that run on the uh, Connecticut Public Radio Network. So with your permission, I'll go ahead and play 
day in 1741, Abel Buell was born in Killingworth, a man able to do most anything, just not very well. Though he more or less failed as a goldsmith, gunsmith, engraver, inventor, auctioneer, and mintmaster, he did make the very first map of the new United States, which sold in 2010 for $1.8 million. What he would have given to have that $1.8 million. So anyway, if you have you know, kind of vaguely had this interest that you would like to know a little bit more about Connecticut history, I hope you will remember the todayincthistory.com website and uh, give us a visit. I, I, I would love to think that tomorrow morning, the people of Darien were launched on a brand new adventure with the history of this state. Boy, would that make me feel good. Now, having done that, let me move on to tell you uh, the story that you came to hear, which is, it, it is a story that in many ways resonates with the present. Uh, they say that history doesn't repeat itself, uh, but that it sure rhymes. And this is one of those cases where it does. The story is called Leaving Connecticut, Shaping America, and it's a story of out-migration to the rest Western Reserve uh, in the early years of the Republic, 1796 to 1820. And off we go. Not too long ago, I spent an uncomfortable evening reading our state's first ever economic strategic plan. A 541-page analysis of Connecticut's economy and what needs to be done to assure that we enjoy a healthy economic future. Among the most troubling of its findings was the following. Since 2000, Connecticut has lost a higher percentage of its 25 to 34-year-old population than any other state in the nation. The plan left no doubt as to how serious a problem this loss of young adults to other places is. Connecticut is at a crossroads, it said. The workforce is aging as talented young workers are leaving the state and population and job growth are stagnating. One of Connecticut's first priorities moving forward, the report indicated, must be creating an economic climate in which our children can not only afford to live in Connecticut, but will be able to prosper. As sobering as this report was, we can perhaps draw some solace from the fact that this isn't the first time in which Connecticut has faced a crisis over the loss of its young people to other more hopeful places. A little over 200 years ago, in May of 1817, Connecticut Governor Oliver Wolcott issued a remarkably similar note of concern in his annual report to the state's General Assembly. An investigation of the causes which produce the numerous emigrations of our industrious and enterprising young men is by far the most important subject which can engage our attention. Connecticut in 1817, as in 2022, was hemorrhaging its young people, the lifeblood of its future, to other more economically attractive locations. And it had been doing so for a long time. On January 1st, 1801, on the first day of the 19th century, the newly chartered Connecticut Academy of Arts and Sciences, in its first project as an organization, had sent a circular letter to each of Connecticut's then 107 towns, asking them to provide detailed answers to 113 questions about their town. One of the items of interest to the Academy was emigrations from the town or society. <clears throat> In their responses, most towns left no doubt that outmigration had been a real problem and one of significant duration. The towns of Haddam and Killingsworth, for example, both reported that 
emigrations from this town have been very numerous. Coventry said, there have been many emigrations from this town to the new countries, so that of late the number of inhabitants has not greatly incre increased. Farmington, with a population of 2,809 people in the 1800 census, reported that 147 families and 40 or more young unmarried persons of both sexes had left the town for a total loss of 775 people, almost 25% of the town's population. Durham explained that the reason that there's been no more increase of population for many years is that individuals and families have removed almost perpetually to other places. Lebanon too reported almost wistfully on the number of inhabitants it had lost. Emigration for more than 30 years has been so constant, it noted, that it's judged that if all who left the town who were still living and their descendants, and the descendants of those who are dead were to return, they would triple the number of inhabitants. Clearly, Governor Wolcott's 1818 message, calling out migration the most important subject which can engage our attention, was addressing a real and serious problem. Where, we might ask, were all those people going? Where did the grass look that much greener? Although they dispersed to sites both far and near, one area in particular proved a very powerful magnet for Connecticut expatriates. This was the part of Northeast Ohio, stretching 120 miles west from the Pennsylvania border and from the 41st degree of latitude to 42 degrees and two minutes, a place many people called New Connecticut, but which was also known and is today still known as Connecticut's Western Reserve. This was the part of its original charter territory that Connecticut reserved ownership of when it ceded its uh, era, <clears throat> excuse me, when it ceded the remainder of its charter lands to the newly formed United States in 1786. Now, anyone who visits the Western Reserve today can't help but be struck by the way in which that region seems to be in town layout, naming patterns and architecture, virtually a mirror image of Connecticut. From Clarendon, the Ohio land of steady habits, to Hudson, Stowe, to Strongsville, the area roughly between Youngstown and Cleveland appears to be nothing less than Connecticut West. But is it? Appearances especially in a post-colonial revival America, can be and often are deceiving. I've become curious about the degree to which the first settlers of the Western Reserve transplanted Connecticut's distinctive institutions, culture, and values to their homeland. Why, I wonder, did people decide to leave Connecticut? What were the push factors driving them out? and the pull factors drawing them to the Western Reserve instead of other possible places. What was the experience of removal like? Who went? How did they travel? How long and how hard was their journey? And how did the people of Connecticut who stayed feel about the emigration of so many of their children? Tonight, I'd like to share with you what I've found out so far. What made so many people from the nutmeg state decide to uproot themselves and their families and head west? Generally, it was the same two factors that have propelled much of human mobility in all times and places, the rhyming twins of need and greed. By 1750, much of Connecticut's arable land east of the Great River, that's the Connecticut River, had been farmed out. Many fields that had once been astonishingly productive were now only as good as fallow periods and limited manure could make them. In addition, everywhere one looked, they saw confirmation that New England's lifestyle had had wonderful effects on old English bodies. Not only had the descendants of the Puritans' first settlers 
lived long and healthful lives. They'd certainly obeyed the biblical injunction to be fruitful and multiply with relish. English emigrants uh, in Connecticut lived twice as long as those who went to Virginia. They lived a decade longer than those they left behind in England. Infant mortality rates were low, marriages early, and childbearing years long. The result was a population explosion that left Connecticut fathers scrambling to find sufficient agricultural land to pass on to their many children. Between 1730 and 1760, in a manner that would have made Thomas Malthus smile, Connecticut's population more than tripled from 38,000 in 1730 to 70,000 in 1749 to over 130,000 by 1760, and on the eve of the American Revolution in 1774, it was close to 200,000. Town populations began to outstrip agricultural capacity. The abundant 150 acres of land granted to the average first settler was soon whittled down by partible inheritance to just enough land to get by, and then not even that. In the 1730s, the demand for more land was satisfied by the sale of 300,000 acres in the Northwest Connecticut Hills. But by 1750, the last of the colony's public lands were gone. Meanwhile, in the land of steady habits, no habit was steadier than regularly producing children. So the need for additional farmland for rising generations became a Connecticut constant. For a time, the need was partially met, or at least was intended to be met, by the sale of lands claimed by the newly formed Susquehanna Land Company. <clears throat> Along the fertile valleys of the Susquehanna River, within the bounds of Connecticut's 1662 charter, a huge area the developers creatively called Westmore Land. The problem was, and you can imagine this, the land claimed by Connecticut was also claimed by Pennsylvania. This led to a generation of intercolonial conflict, sometimes truly violent, that was ultimately decided in favor of the Keystone State. Land-hungry Connecticans, especially those who had served in the expeditions against Canada during the French and Indian Wars, also were attracted to the northern Connecticut River Valley. Up the valley, these land-hungry migrants came, bringing their families, possessions, and Connecticut town names with them to places like Wyndham, Windsor, Orange, and Essex, counties, among others, to create a new Guilford, Pomfret, Hartford, Wallingford, Brookfield, Norwich, Middlebury, Salisbury, Goshen, Bethel, and the list just goes on and on. This desire to carry old Connecticut to new lands was so strong that 25 of the 211 Vermont town names appearing in America's first census, about one out of every eight towns was named after a Connecticut town of origin. So many Connecticut's moved north into this previously unsettled region in the years immediately after the French and Indian War, that when the inhabitants assembled to declare themselves on January 15, 1777, to be a free and independent jurisdiction or state, they declared that they were forever hereafter to be called, known, and distinguished by the name of New Connecticut, alias Vermont. Now, for most migrants, Vermont soon proved to be too hilly, too rocky, and way too cold. And in the years after the American Revolution, many looked to lands in Western New York State, promoted by speculators such as Oliver Phelps, who in 1787 contracted to buy over 6 million acres in Genesee County for resale to New England out migrants from his land office in Suffield, Connecticut. These lands were indeed attractive, 
But the biggest plum in the West for land speculators would be settlers and the people of Connecticut collectively were the 5,000 square miles of territory included in the Western Reserve. Adventuring in lands and procuring inhabitants to settle them was then, as the Connecticut diplomat and profiteer Silas Dean noted, the best branch of business in America. And the agreement Connecticut made with the United States carving out the Western Reserve from the rest of the Northwest Territory prompted a decade-long debate over how the reserve land should be sold, who should sell them, and what should be done with the proceeds. The debate proceeded in a pretty relaxed fashion, no doubt in part because during that 10 year long debate, the Ohio country was the scene of many of the most deadly battles between indigenous peoples and whites in American history. Mad Anthony Wayne's decisive victory at the Battle of Fallen Timbers near present day Toledo in 1794, followed by the Treaty of Greenville the following year, effectively cleared the Western Reserve for white settlement. And that uh, meant that simultaneously, the uh, Jay Treaty with England meant that the British too would vacate the Northwest. Now, not surprisingly, this agreement uh, that the Indians would move out of the territory and that the British would no longer have troops stationed in, on American soil uh, led to an agreement on how to sell the Western Reserve lands that very same year. The reserve was sold in the fall of 1795 for $1,200,000 in notes to the Connecticut Land Company, a syndicate of venture capitalists whose names read to some extent like a who's who of Connecticut's venerable standing order. Edwards, Bull, Griswold, Root, Stoddard, Holbrook, Lyman, Morgan, families whose members had been part of the ruling oligarchy of Connecticut for generations were thoroughly salted among the names of the newly wealthy. The biggest investor was Oliver Phelps of Suffield, already heavily invested in New York's Genesee country, who signed on for $168,000 of the debt. The smallest investor, Sylvanus Griswold from a very important family, put himself on the hook for one one hundredth of that amount. A 50 person surveying team led by Moses Cleveland of Canterbury was sent out the following spring and in 1796 and 1797, the Western Reserve was mapped, staked, and made ready for sale. The surveying method Cleveland's party used both copied and departed from that used by the surveyors of the United States' Northwest Territory from which the Western Reserve had been carved out. The grid system employed in the Northwest Territory was used dividing up the landscape into uniform rectangular lots of equal size. Townships that were six miles square subdivided into sections that were one square mile each. The Connecticut Land Company laid out townships that were only five miles square, also subdivided into sections of one square mile. The Connecticut land speculators, unlike the United States government, did not specifically reserve one section in each township for the support of public schools. Now that's really ironic because when the state of Connecticut sold the land, it dedicated all proceeds from the sale to support public education, but only in Connecticut. You just can't overestimate the importance of the grid system in the history of American westward expansion. Laying out distant and unknown lands into packages of the same size and shape turned an irregular and unknown landscape into a standardized commodity that could be bought and sold at standardized prices, located with specificity on a map, and easily exchanged for other parcels of land of the same size and shape 
by people who had never actually laid eyes on it. The Western Reserve surveyors began in the southeast corner of the reserve, and they numbered the township south to north in sequence until they came to Lake Erie. Each vertical strip of townships was called a range. Ranges were numbered from east to west. Thus, a prospective purchaser sitting in Lyme or Darien could look at a map and see that the land he was being offered in Range 3, Section 13 was adjacent to both Lake Erie and the Ashtabula River, while Range 12, Section 6 was along the Cuyahoga River, just south of the proposed town of Cleveland. The language of range and township became the lingua franca of westward expansion and letters to and from the reserve are loaded with discussions of the qualities of various places to settle, all described in reference to the grid system. To assure that each investor got a proportionate share of the reserve's better and lesser quality lands, the Connecticut Land Company distributed the surveyed land through a cumbersome lottery system, which resulted in all the proprietors gaining land holdings uh, to resell that were scattered throughout the reserve. An unintended consequence of this mode of distribution was that the subsequent sale of these randomly drawn parcels of land to settlers produced a settlement pattern in Northern Ohio significantly different than the one through which Connecticut itself had been settled. Whereas the most common form of settlement in old Connecticut had been clustered settlement by congregations in new towns, which later grew and then spread out by hiving off daughter towns, settlement in the Western Reserve was from the beginning to be much more individualized and broadly dispersed. Land was usually purchased not by congregations, but by individuals who chose their location based on what they could find out about specific parcels being offered and what they could afford. For many years, the cabin in the clearing, not the inviting village, was the most common site in New Connecticut. In any event, even as the Connecticut Reserve was being made ready for sale, a kind of westward fever had gripped the east. People were on the move and their direction was toward the setting sun. In early March of 1795, the Connecticut Journal ran a story from Albany, New York, indicating that upwards of 1,200 sleighs loaded with women, children, and furniture coming from the east have passed through this city within three days. The current of emigration, it noted, flows incessantly through this city. Two months later, the Norwich Packet ran a story from Whitestown, New York, which reported that land speculators are everywhere to be found, and the number of honest husbandmen who are moving westward exceed all calculation. The story estimated that 15 or 20 boats a day, filled with families moving westward, passed by Old Fort Schuyler near Lake Oneida, the West, it asserted confidently, will become as populous as the Connecticut hive. What was it that drove so many people to leave Connecticut at the beginning of the American era? Certainly, the opportunity to trade a limited parcel of worn out land for a much larger tract of fertile and virgin soil was primary. One astute observer in 1717 noted the similarities, or pardon me, 1817, noted the similarities between the Western migrants and the semi-sedentary Indian groups who had once roamed the land. Americans, he noted, partake in no small degree of the habits of their predecessors, the indigenous Aborigines, who, when they have exhausted one hunting ground, pull up stakes and incontinently march off to another, four or 500 miles off where game is plenty. So he said, <clears throat> with honest brother Jonathan, when he has eaten up everything around him 
and worked his land to skin and bone. And when the house is just on the point of tumbling about his ears, <coughs> excuse me, instead of taking the trouble of restoring the one or rebuilding the other, he abandons both and packing up his movables consisting of his wife and chubby boys in a wagon, whistles himself to the banks of the Ohio. But desire for land is only part of the story. One who reads the many accounts of this epic diaspora carefully soon finds a host of other reasons pushing migrants out of Connecticut, even as promoters' enthusiastic accounts drew them westward. These additional factors, which built in intensity throughout the early decades of the 19th century, undoubtedly help explain why the stream of emigrants to the Western Reserve became a literal torrent after 1815. To begin with, Connecticut in the early 19th century faced an environmental crisis on several fronts. Our age concerned with global warming has almost forgotten that early America was held in the grip of a period of intense cold known as the Little Ice Age. This severe cooling of the Earth's temperature, which lasted roughly from 1450 to 1850, had internal cycles of warmer and colder weather, and the decade from 1810 to 1820 proved to be the coldest single period ever recorded in North America. Growing seasons were shortened by several weeks, and Connecticuts were required to heat their homes eight months out of 12. To make matters worse, in 1815, the biggest volcanic eruption ever recorded took place on Mount Tambora in the Indonesian archipelago. The 400 million tons of gas released by the volcano shrouded the earth in vapor, producing in 1816 what they called the year without a summer. In New England, snow fell during every month of the year. Crops failed and firewood, the victim of a major tree felling hurricane that had blasted through New England in 1815 was in critically short supply. The climatic crisis created an economic crisis for marginal farmers, many of whom just threw in the towel in the east and joined the hopeful heading west. <clears throat> Some people had political reasons for leaving New England. A writer in the Worcester Spy noted that in addition to the sterility of our soil and the coldness of our climate, some people were emigrating because of the overbearing oppression of the predominant party, a party who would not employ or buy of a Republican if they could possibly obtain the same of a Federalist. Has a Republican an equal chance with a Federalist in this region, in commerce, at the bar, in physic, in divinity, or in any other profession whatsoever? We know they have not. Others echoed the criticism, pointing out that Connecticut's Federalist standing order, the elites uh, subject to perpetual reelection, largely on the strength of their old and venerated family names, had used the bankruptcy and imprisonment laws to enrich themselves at the expense of the state's Republicans. Calling the laws allowing for seizure of debtors' property weapons in the hands of your party to assist them in perpetuating their own power and to oppress political opponents, a Republican writer for the Hartford Times claimed that for many Republicans, emigration or imprisonment seems to be the only alternative. Federalist policy has driven Republicans to this dreadful situation. They must leave that party or leave this state. Such criticism of Connecticut as a state whose government was so hostile to political opponents that it sent them into exile raises the interesting possibility that the Western Reserve, rather than being as was desired, a place to which Connecticut's political culture was transplanted, was 
Instead, its antithesis, a Republican stronghold espousing anti-federalist political principles. Other motivations discussed as causes of outmigration from Connecticut include religious intolerance. Connecticut forced its citizens to pay taxes, all of them to pay taxes to support the established Congregational Church until 1818. That was one complaint that people who weren't Congregationalists really resented. And the other was inequitable taxation in general. Connecticut laws taxed farm families as much as 70% more than those who worked in other employments. So then as now, the state's tax burden was a factor driving many to remove. A shortage of land and that land exhausted. A multi-stranded environmental crisis. Political repression that spilled over into economic and social life religious intolerance and inequitable taxation. All these appear to have been factors behind the thousands of individual decisions made by Connecticut's in the early 1800s to pick up stakes and head west. But who went and how, having made the decision to go to the Western Reserve, did they get there? I have at this point in my research, two images of Connecticut's out migrants one that's a bit too close up, and another that's a bit too distant. The too close image comes from the numerous diaries, journals, and travel narratives recorded by various individuals who made the trek west and lived to write about it. These indispensable accounts by people such as the surveyor Seth Pease, missionaries Joseph Badger and Thomas Robbins, the physician Zira Hawley, the English traveler, D. Griffith, and the young woman in search of a husband, Margaret Van Horn Dwight, give us much of the indispensable detail of the journey to and conditions in the early Western Reserve. But as good as these accounts are, and Margaret Van Horn Dwight's is a classic travel narrative, they're also idiosyncratic tales of one person's observations one sojourner's interpretation of their own unique experiences. The too far image that I have is a collective view of the effects of migration as revealed by the historical census data records. Their focus is hazy, but it does give us a sense of some characteristic common to the migrants as a group. The census data tells us that the population of New Connecticut, as the reserve was also known, was different in significant and important ways from old Connecticut. Not surprisingly, given the effort it took to literally begin the world anew in the wilderness, people there were much younger than back home. Old Connecticut was then, as today, a graying population. More than one of every six people in Connecticut was 45 years or older at a time when only one out of three people could expect to reach their 60th birthday. On the Western Reserve, the number of adults over 45 was fewer than one in 10. Also unlike old Connecticut, where women slightly outnumbered men throughout the period of migration, the Western Reserve population was skewed toward males by a ratio of 54% to 46%. In politics, that kind of number would be called a landslide. For a lot of men in the Western Reserve, it was called a long, very cold, very lonely winter. Seeing this condition, the travel writer John Mellish urged emigrating New Englanders to take a greater portion of the blooming Yankee girls along with them and not suffer nearly 17,000 to pine away as old maids in their own country when it's seen they are so very much wanted in this one. Another important but predictable finding of the census data is that while Connecticut's population was relatively stable in terms of growth, the Western Reserve was booming. It experienced a 236% population increase 
between 1810 and 1820. I would really like to know, of course, to be able to chart that growth year by year, but that data is simply unavailable. <clears throat> now, if the census data gives us an insight into how Connecticut's Western Reserve was taking shape demographically, the journals and diaries give us a view of what the experience of removal and resettlement was like. While each account is a personal one, some observations seem appropriate to all of them. To begin with, the journey west was both long and hard, between 500 and 650 miles, depending on the route selected and the destination. Road conditions ranged from very bad to deplorable for most of the journey. In heavy rains, roads became mud pits and streams impassable. In some wetland areas, efforts were made to ameliorate the muddiness by building corduroy roads of logs placed perpendicular to the direction of travel, which provided its own kind of hellish discomfort. The generally awful state of the heavily traveled routes may help explain why many people preferred to pull their goods westward on sleds during the winter snowpack. And the fact that thousands could do that is a reminder of just how cold that little ice age was. The would-be emigrant had choice of two possible routes to the Western Reserve. Geographer Bill Keegan, using accounts of several early migrants, created a map that shows the traveler's options. A northern route went up the Mohawk Valley and crossed New York to Buffalo. There a choice had to be made between travel by boat along Lake Erie's southern shore, or to continue to follow the rugged trail along the lake shore. Neither one was a cakewalk. The southern route crossed Pennsylvania along the old Forbes Road, cut during the French and Indian War. Then it crossed the mountains into Pittsburgh and followed trails into the Western Reserve at Youngstown. Neither route was easy. They both were incredibly difficult and neither offered significant advantages over the other in time or distance. Although there was significant variation in the duration of travelers' journeys, they seemed to have averaged 12 to 15 miles a day, less when crossing the mountains, more when the weather was good and the terrain flat and dry. Six weeks seems to have been the average for the trip, though as transportation improvements such as canals and better roads came into play near the end of the period, travel time to the Western Reserve seems to have decreased. A seemingly determined Zira Hawley made the journey in only 23 days in 1820. The Reverend Joseph Badger, who did a lot of preaching along the way, he would stop and preach to trees if they seemed interested. He took over four months. But no matter how long the journey took, it was an experience no traveler would ever forget. In addition to the not inconsiderable physical dangers of traveling bad roads, fording swelled streams and rivers, and climbing and descending high mountain passes, migrants experienced inhospitable treatment at overcrowded and often squalid inns and taverns. They slept fitfully among strangers, ate bad food with rowdy, drunken, and sometimes dangerous fellow travelers, and fought off both homesickness and fear of the unknown. Henry Levitt Ellsworth sought to procure for himself some instruments of death prior to leaving Connecticut to protect himself from the rare but not unknown incidences of highway robbery along the trail. For many of the Connecticut migrants who had lived their entire lives among the remarkably homogenous and undiverse population of the nutmeg state, the journey west produced their first exposure to groups of people who were different in language, culture, and values than they were. Many found such contact disconcerting, some found it offensive, and others even frightening. Consider, for example, the prim and proper Margaret Van Horn Dwight's description of the Germans she encountered 
violating Connecticut's time-honored blue law restrictions for Sunday deportment at an inn in Hanover, Pennsylvania in 1810. I should not have thought it possible to pass a Sabbath in our country among such a dissolute, vicious set of wretches as we are now among. I believe at least 50 Dutchmen, those are German men, the Deutsch language, have been here today to smoke, drink, swear, pitch sense, almost dance, laugh and talk Dutch and stare at us. They come in in droves, young and old, black and white, women and children. It's dreadful to see so many people that you cannot speak to or understand. But if the Rhodes West brought migrants significant exposure to things previously unknown, it's also clear that they were never far removed from some connection to the state from which they had left. For all along the way, in town after little town, many of which are now all but forgotten, migrants reported encountering persons they had known in or who came from Connecticut but who now resided in this or that way station on the slow Western journey. The roads to the Western Reserve, particularly the Northern routes, <clears throat> were studded with Connecticans who like themselves had chosen to seek their fortunes in the West, just not as far West as the Western Reserve. Were these people who had started out for the reserve and found other possibilities along the way? Had they found the road west a road too far or found better opportunities closer to their original home? For now, all I can say is that the tens of thousands of Connecticut natives who started out for New Connecticut in the early 1800s found thousands of fellow former nutmeggers along the way with whom they shared an important bond of common origin. How did all these migrants feel about pulling up roots and leaving their native state? Some undoubtedly felt a pioneer's excitement at facing a world that was all possibility. Others, perhaps younger sons not in line to inherit the family farm, seethed with resentment about being forced into exile. And some, it is clear, saw having to leave Connecticut for the West as a sign of shame, a visible symbol that they were the expendable ones. How else can we explain Margaret Van Horn Dwight's comment on day two of her journey? The country we pass through till we are beyond New York, I need not describe to you, nor indeed could I, for I am attended by a very unpleasant, though not uncommon, companion one to whom I have bowed in subjection ever since I left you, pride. It has entirely prevented me seeing the country lest I should be known. And so I suppose it will attend me to the mountains, then I am sure it will bid me adieu. Hiding in the wagon so she wouldn't be recognized. This is something about migration that we rarely see and almost never think about. But once we encounter it, it complicates all those jingoistic presentations of Anglos hot in pursuit of manifest destiny. Surely, Connecticut's left their state with mixed emotion. But how did those who stayed behind view their leaving? <clears throat> In most cases, Connecticut's, at least those not involved in promoting the sale of the Western lands, viewed the outmigration with grave concern. One observer lamented that Connecticut's population had been kept down and attributed to the fact that migration from Connecticut must have rateably exceeded the migration from any of the other states. The effect of the 50,000 New Englanders who have for a number of years passed annually over the Alleghenies, led another writer to bemoan the severe decline of New England's political clout in favor of the new states. Other Connecticut saw the outmigration as producing not just a youth drain, 
but a serious capital outflow as well. The property that is carried out by this constant stream of migration, wrote one, cannot be much, if any, less than a million dollars yearly, which waste is not repaired. Worse than the loss of capital was the outmigrant's potential loss of human civility. More than a few critics hearken back to this old Puritan fear of what they called Creolian degeneracy, the likely possibility that settlers living in a wilderness environment would lose their civilized humanity and return to a savage state of nature. The transition from civilization to savageness is much easier than from the latter to the former, warned a Hartford current commentator. He warned of a population of millions of our own color, flesh, and blood who lived without schools, without a ministry, without religious institutes, without the Sabbath, without Bibles, sunk and still sinking into the depths of moral debasement. Another writer, who styled himself only a Connecticut farmer, urged those thinking of leaving to reconsider before it was too late. Few, very few, I believe, of those who have sold the inheritance of their fathers to improve their fortunes in the Western lands have fully counted the cost of their undertaking. For myself, he said, I love my native state. I reverence her laws, her religion, her morals, and her habits, and would not exchange them for the silver mines of Peru. Well, I love my state too. And like the man who called himself Connecticut farmer in 1818, I certainly lament the loss of our state's young people today, just as he lamented those thousands on the road in the early 1800s. I feel a bit badly as well about leaving all those out migrants uh, and you as, as people kind enough to come and listen to this talk um, in transit to the Western Reserve. Uh, like you, at least I hope like you, I've still got many questions about what happened to these people when they got to Ohio and how their effort to make their lives anew progressed. Did they ultimately create that new Connecticut in the Western Reserve or did the Western Reserve create them anew? That at least for now will have to be a story for another time. But I hope that when I've been out there more, spent more time there, come back and spent more time immersing myself in the literature here, uh, that when I get that story all together, that you might consider inviting me back to hear the rest of this story from Connecticut and America's past in the Western Reserve. And I thank you so much for coming tonight and so much for letting me tell you about our, the last time our young people were leaving the state. So thank you, Amanda, back to you. Thank you so much, Walt, this was amazing. And I completely forgot about the volcanic eruption that would it snow like eight months out of the year? It did, yeah, it was terrible. And, oh my and what did we just have a couple of weeks ago? We yeah. had another <laughs> one in, uh, was it Tonga where? Yeah. And they say it was one of the worst volcanic eruptions in a century. So mm -hmm. who knows? We may be looking for um, more snowfall, lots yeah. more snowfall. Is there a lot of um, information about that time? A lot of like diary entries and- Oh my goodness, yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I never cease to be amazed about as a historian is how much information from the past is out there. There, you know, it's often not the thing you most want to find, but there's, <laughs> there's just an amazing, we, the people in this country have, of course, let me, let me qualify this. The people in charge of running the country have been excellent for centuries at keeping the, at protecting the documents that tell their history. They've often been 
uh, remarkably remiss in keeping the documents we so would like to have today in telling the stories of the people who uh, fed them, made them rich, ran their factories, cooked their meals, raised their children. That's, you know, that's an area of history that is, uh, it's a focus of so many people's work these days. And the information is there, but it's not as easy to come by. Mm -hmm. It'd be fascinating to see. See, we have a few people in the chat. Um, were both Vermont and the Western Reserve both called New Connecticut? Yes. And, you know, and there and little new Connecticut's popped up all over the place. It's kind of funny, but um, but the, you know, new Vermont pretty rapidly morphed out of New Connecticut into Vermont, whereas the Western Reserve kept that new Connecticut. Uh, it really it carried that new Connecticut brand with it in one form or another into into the 20th century into the mid 20th century and there are still people in northern ohio who take a great deal of pride in uh saying they live in the connecticut western reserve hmm. so and i don't know any of you who have been over to eastern the eastern part of northern connecticut know it really does look a lot like new a lot like connecticut it Places like Stowe and Hudson and, and, you know, any place between Cleveland and the Pennsylvania line, it will probably remind you very much of places you've seen in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. It'd actually be a fun road trip to take. Yeah, it, well, I, yeah, I, I, have, uh, I have taken it many well, times. Maybe not fun for everybody. I, I will tell you what <laughs> I've learned is that pencil, when you're driving, Pennsylvania is the only state in America that stretches in both the heat and the cold. <laughs> it's, it's incredibly wide and it just keeps getting bigger. <laughs> and you just have a few thank yous in the chat. And once again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank I'll, you I'll all have everyone, you and have a wonderful two. night. Stay warm. Uh, watch out for the next snowstorm, and thank you very much for having me. Amanda, it was great to see you. Of again. course. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night, everyone.